Hello, everybody, and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. How is everyone doing this evening? Welcome back to the One Man Low Council and to episode 286 of the Welcome to Asgard podcast. Because, yes, indeed, this is a podcast that I update whenever I can. I have fallen behind as of late. Apologies to Toph Morris, who is indeed a $5 backer over on Anchor.fm. Shout out to you, good sir, and thank you for continuing to support the podcast. Before going any further, please make sure you smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching on Odyssey, because we are live on DLive, Periscope, YouTube, and Odyssey. As you all know, falling behind in the chat is a long pastime here in Asgard. And so if you have a comment or question, please put at Odin, no matter what platform you're watching from, at Odin at the very beginning of your comment. And it lets me know you're trying to get my attention. And I appreciate it. All that being said, when will the real BBC end? That is the real question. That is the real topic of this evening is how long is too long? I mean, come on, guys. You've already been streaming for like four or five hours. Call, call it a night, man. But anyway, tonight we're going to be talking about the No Time to Die box office, the latest James Bond movie, which is set to release internationally in select markets, uh, I believe starting as early as this week, if not uh, next week, definitely over the next couple of weeks. So there's questions of how well or not well that film will do. But the bigger question, and it's been getting a little bit of buzz on social media, is that apparently according to MovieWeb, which is not a movie news source that I typically would put much trust in. They claim that the film needs to make $900 million to break even. Now, I've looked at the article, I've looked at the math that they've used, and I'm finding that there are some faults. Uh, There is, of course, an assumption, and really it seems they're the only site that is reporting this specific number as far as what the current budget of the film is. And they make a pretty big mistake and a pretty big error in how they calculate the amount of money needed for this film. So we'll go ahead and go through that article, go through the numbers that they give, and explain why they are off in their projections probably by a good $150 million. (laughs) Because... Again, the film needs to make a lot of money. No Time to Die needs to make a lot of money to make its uh, profit, rather, to to break even. It does not need to make $900 at this point. Until there is actually a legitimate source that gives us an updated production budget, and until we actually start to get some more information about marketing costs, etc., at this point, the film needs more likely... More accurately, I should say, to make closer to $750 million to break even. Now, that is still a very high bar. Really, only one other film in the last year and a half has really reached that number, and that is Fast 9, F9, Fast and Furious 9. And I don't think a lot of people are going to be expecting this movie to reach those heights. But I do think that the number of throwing out, it needs to make $900 million dollars is, I think, a bit of a reach, probably a little bit of a clickbait as far as title is concerned. So we'll talk about what the actual numbers likely are going to uh, be and what the actual projected need of the film to break even is going to be as well. But let's say hello to some people in the chat. First off, JKDBuck76 has now been a member for six months in a row at the Citizen of Asgardian level. Thank you very much, good sir. Matthew Highland was here early, saying, Hair, if you're not first, you're last. Yes, Ricky Bobby would have a lot to say about that. Tina B bringing up again what MovieWeb had said about $900 million, which again, as I said, is not accurate based on the numbers that we have, at least as far as those numbers that have been officially put out there, and also by the official standard by which you have to do the mathematics, which there's, again, some questions as to what kind of mathematics MovieWeb uses, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Either way, it does not look good, does not look good at all for that film, so I just want to make that very clear. I do not think the film is in a good position to make money, let alone break even, 
but it's not nearly as bad as MovieWeb is trying to uh, seem to indicate. Snorri Poopus Cuber, what's going on? How are all humans and other quitters? Hello to you. Joey Horn, welcome. Back to the chat, good sir. Congratulations on winning the Steelbook 4K for Snatch the other day. I'll be trying to send that out sometime this week. Andrew Hayes, what's going on, dude? Thank you very much for joining again. Tina B, Empress of the Universe, in the chat, telling everyone how it goes. I very much appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. I always appreciate it. Gary Banjo Sandwich Worthington tagged to say, No Time to Die is actually coming. Can we get a poll on who is excited or not about the film? Something tells me if you're going to ask this specific crowd, you're going to find very few people that are actually looking forward to the movie. And to be honest, how, how can you be blamed? Even if you are generally a James Bond fan a Daniel Craig fan and, and even if you have liked the trailers thus far I think that you would still have to be honest in saying that there's probably a a lot of people as we talked about last time with our, our wordsmithing there's probably a plethora of people that have lost interest in this film simply because it has taken so long for this film to come out and when you have that much delay in a film, and when you have still the need to keep the film in the minds and in the discussions of the people, of the general movie-going population, and so in order to do that, you have stories coming out about the behind-the-scenes collaborations, the bringing on of people like Phoebe Waller-Bridge, the questions of whether or not this is going to try and have a hashtag MeToo era version of James Bond, those are the types of things that continue to push people away. And so any potential audience that you may have had kind of gets pushed out the window. In addition to the people that just kind of lose interest over time. Because once you have a film and once you have a release date and you push that release date back several times over, why would anyone want to really get excited about any movie? Because we, we've gotten to the point now and obviously... A lot of people probably don't feel this way for No Time to Die. But think about a movie where you were really excited for it, and all of a sudden it got pushed back. And you're like, okay, I'm frustrated. And then let's say you got excited once again for that movie just about to come out, and then they pushed it back again. So you're basically dealing also with a group of fans, a group of audience members, who are probably just so tired of caring about this movie because they've had to do it so many times over with a bunch of stuff being pushed away and pushed down the road that... They've just genuinely, genuinely lost interest at, at the most basic level. Joey Horn, who is a member, says, I really have zero interest in the new Bond flick. Maybe I'll get motivated to watch it. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. The big question is, how many people are actually going to get motivated to watch this movie? Since it is going to be released internationally very soon, we are getting to the point where it does not seem that they're going to push this film back anymore. They're just going to say, all right, we spent over $300 million as far as the production budget on this film. We spent close to $450 million when it comes to adding on marketing, typical marketing cost. And again, that's being much more on the conservative side of things. And we need to make north of $750 million just to break even. Okay. Good luck, <laughs> is what I say to those people. Uh, let's see. If ever Sci-Fi is a member, hail to you. Kara Tharp is a member. What's going on? What's going on? Welcome back. Hologram Nunchuck in the chat. Thank you very much for being here today. I appreciate it. We got Alice McCarthy. What's going on? He says, howdy. Oh, and how's it going? How's Thor? No time to die. More than like more time to eat pizza. Definitely. I would definitely much rather spend my time and attention on pizza than on no time to die. I think that a lot of people would probably share in my desire with that. Andrew Hayes, thank you for tagging me, good sir. Thank you for being here. Father Christopher Miller, hail to you, Father. So it's probably appropriate that I'm trying out for the first time some Tennessee mango habanero whiskey, yum yum. Well, I am not one that takes up the drink, but hey, it is what it is. I'm a straight edge individual. James Dachier, what's going on? The Physics Channel with Kenny Lee, what's going on? Peeb. Says Hail Odin, Hail to you. Laura Story, the modern major general of the channel. What's going on, Laura? Thank you for being here this evening. we got Rosie G12, who's a member as well. Hail to you, Rosie. So very glad to have you here. So very glad to have you here. 
We got Rob D in the chat as well. Hello, Odin. Did you ever watch any of the DC animated movies? Watch Death of Superman this weekend. And we're going to watch Reign of the Superman after this. I never really got into the DC animated films. I've heard great things about them. And, hey, if, if that's your bag, then great. That's awesome for you. I, I just have never really been drawn to them. I, I love some of the classic animated ones like Mask of the Phantasm, which I only saw really for the first time in the last couple of years. I thought that was a really good film. And I would remembered also watching it. Oh, I had seen this when I was a child. I just had forgotten about it because I just thought it was like a longer episode of, of the series of the uh, animated series of Batman, which was, again, still some of the best Batman that I've seen in my own life, at least my own my own opinion. So, yeah, I think that it's uh, obviously it's an area of DC fandom that I think a lot of people like and have a lot of good things and positive things to see. It's just not really for me. Uh, it's just not really my thing. Evan S., what's going on? Uh, personally, I think they're going fine. I think that they're going fine. You know, obviously, you have teenagers, so they're rambunctious a little bit during class, a little bit with some of the classes. But in general, it's been pretty good. Uh, I think the masks have been probably the most difficult part of it all because it is a little bit more difficult to breathe, let alone lecture. And then, of course, having to uh, watch others having to wear it and deal with it and struggle through it and everything. It's just, it's not fun. It's definitely not fun. Snorri Pupa says, people love, some people love to hear themselves talk and talk and talk. This is very true. This is very true. Some people may accuse me of doing that. I am personally not one of them. Uh, James S.J. says, what are your thoughts on the Matrix sequels? Do you think they are bad movies? Yeah, absolutely, dude. Yes. First Matrix is a great film. Second Matrix, eh, okay. The third Matrix is just not good. It, it just it gets worse and worse and worse. And this fourth one, I have no desire to see it because at the end of the day, the Wachowski brothers, they're just going to try and spin this into, one, a cash grab, clearly. And two, I would not be surprised if they also try to put some type of political motivation, trying to turn it into a, a tale of, of, of a trans story of some kind. Since now, remember, they, they went back and, and tried to change history by saying, oh, it was always a trans story and narrative. And it's like, no, no, it isn't. It's a relatively new phenomenon that, that was being talked about here. Let's see. Laura says, I love Bond movies, but I'm not excited for this one. Yeah, and I don't blame you. I do not blame you at all. I think that Daniel Craig had some pretty good ones. I personally was a big fan of Casino Royale. It's probably one of the best of the more recent James Bond films. It's probably one of my favorites, to be honest, out of all of them that I've seen. And I I really enjoyed it for what it was. And, and just, again, it's a really good movie. Just a really good story, Casino Royale. I really also liked Skyfall. I thought Skyfall was a lot of fun as well. I thought uh, Casino Royale was still a better movie, but Skyfall, Skyfall was great. Uh, Roger Deakins did an amazing job doing the cinematography for that. So I think I was actually more drawn to that movie, less because of story or acting, but more so because the visuals were just so stunning and so beautiful. And then you have films like Spectre, which were just bleh, kind of just in the middle. And and then, of course, you had that atrocity that was Quantum of Solace. You know, it is what it is. Uh, Physics Channel with Kenny Lee says, Mahler can't stream less than six hours. That's the thing, though. Yes, he can. This is the choice. This is the choice. Uh, Andrew Hayes says, isn't the real BBC government run if they will probably never shut off unless war comes? Uh, the real BBC, I don't know if that's, a if that's just a joke, Andrew Hayes. I was talking more so about the uh, show that Ner Gary from Nerdrotic as and Mahler do with each other. But anyway, please make sure they all smash that like button. It really does mean a lot. Now let's go ahead and just dive into then this first story here because I do think it's very important that we look and see where is this number coming from, right? This has really uh, gotten a lot of attention in the news recently, specifically from No Time to Die. So first off, let's go with what has been verified. So this is from Variety, and this is one of the last times that we got any idea of what this film cost. As it says right here, bringing No Time to Die to the screen was already a pricey proposition, the, uh, the film, which marks Daniel Craig's final turn as 007, carried a $301 million net budget. Plus, Craig and producers Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson, who control the rights of the series, have generous back-end and profit participation deals, limiting the amount of money MGM is able to make on the movie. So, looks like MGM is actually really uh, kind of screwed in the long run. It's also interesting because... In the pushing backs of these films, it says they had already spent $66 million in marketing at the time in which they first delayed this movie. And so, 
As I said, even in my own projections, I'm very much giving a conservative estimate about what the film cost when you add in production and marketing. But let's look and see where this number's coming from. So this is from MovieWeb, and as you can see, their headline is, No Time to Die needs to earn $900 million to break even as the most expensive film ever. Now, here is what is interesting to me. They say here, now a year later, that has risen, talking about their production budget, to around 226 million pounds or 314 million dollars. And once marketing costs have been added into the astronomically priced mix, that comes to around 464 million at the lower end, making the rough figure no time dies to make between in order, to, or sorry, will need to make in order to be profitable. And here's where they make their mistake. It says, however, where the $900 million box office figure comes into play is due to the split between the cinematic exhibitor and the movie's distributors, with MGM likely expected to take around 50% of every dollar spent on cinema tickets worldwide, meaning the movie needs to make at least $928 million, and thus the most expensive James Bond movie was born. Here is the issue, though. They claim that the movie needs to, or rather that a studio gets only 50%, of the box office take, and I say nay nay. I say nay nay to that, because the number is actually 60%. The number is actually 60%, and again, I'm kind of hoping and was hoping that they would have a, a little bit of a citation of where they get this $314 million from. Again, it just seems like they just claim it for themselves, I guess, I don't know. But as I said, the last real official update we had for as far as an official reported budget was around the $301 million mark. And so let's then assume it's the $301 million mark, or hell, let's go ahead and and, and put forward their, their nonsense of $314 million. All right, so that means that the film does cost around $450 to $464 million when you add in marketing costs, because you have to basically multiply it by 1.5 is what gets you your typical marketing cost. That, of course, is not taking into account that the film likely had more spent on marketing because of the fact that it's been delayed and they've already spent a lot of money on marketing in the first place before it was delayed the first time. And so therefore the movie could easily have cost upwards of $500 million or so. The problem with the number that they come up with though, is that 50% number that they claim in reality, it's closer to 60%. Now this is of course more of an average, right? This is something where it's roughly around 60%. Also, this does not take into account any special deals that studios have with different countries or different companies, different revenue streams. Obviously, you talk about the ways in which they oftentimes have uh, different types of products featured in their films, right? Product placement. So there's very uh, a lot of questions about how much money they get from that. So it gets very complicated when you try and add in all of the revenue streams. But when you look at just box office, the number, the rule of thumb that has been around for a long time has been, no, they make around 60% of their entire box office. So when you take the 60% into account, you're looking for, at a film that needs to make closer to around 700 to $750 million to break even. So yeah, the $900 million is a bit of a stretch. Obviously, I, I think it was much more so put out there as, as a way of trying to get a headline, to be perfectly honest. But that is, again, where their, uh, their issue comes in. Again, they're claiming this 50%, which is not really accurate based on the numbers. They're also claiming a new updated budget, which, as I said, does not really seem to be backed up by any actual data. And uh, again, Variety, this is talking about what was reported as the budgets, where again, it just seems like they are just kind of coming up with this $314 million instead. And um, I think it is, again, interesting to say the very least to see exactly how these things are going to play out. But the fact remains, the film does need to make around $750 million or so just to break even. And that is still going to be a very difficult feat for this movie, especially in the current market and based on the fact that it is a movie that has now been pushed back so many times, the question, and I think it is a legitimate question, needs to be able to, at, needs to be able to be asked, and that question is, do people still care? Do people still care enough to actually want to see this film or not? We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. But anyway, let's go ahead and get back into the chat. Uh, Gradania says, no time to release. Yeah, there's so many 
great jokes. There's so many great jokes that can be made about it because whether it's 900 or 750, 750 million dollars it has to make, it's very unlikely for it to do that. Is it possible? Sure, anything's possible. They were able to get a China release date. China could easily give them 100 to 200 million dollars. It's unlikely that they'll go up to 200 million dollars. I think 100 million dollars or so, 100 to 150 million is a little bit more realistic for China for No Time to Die. But even then, remember that that is kind of a bit of fool's gold because of the fact that there is very little return on the investment from China. Because, again, the communists get the vast majority of the money, which is why any studio that works with the Chinese Communist Party and works with their censors not only gives into free speech violations, but most especially gives into human rights violations and also helps to fund a government that, as we know and has been verified, literally imprisons people and literally has concentration camps where they go after, sterilize, etc. their Muslim populations, the Uyghur, the Uyghur concentration camps. Let's talk about that. Let's point that out. And let's never forget that fact. Anyway, if that money comes from China, though, it's fool's gold. So even if that somehow is able to puff up the number, is it going to be able to pump it up to seven to nine hundred million dollars? I have my doots about that. Gary Banjo Sandwich says, "No time for pocket change." Pretty much, I would say they're lucky if they would be lucky if they even got a quarter, <laughs> because I honestly think that it's just, it's it's gonna it's gonna be a massive financial loss. When you look at every other major budget film to come out this year, very few, if any have been able to make their money back and have profit. When you look at the number made by a film like Fast 9, when you break down the numbers and take into account the $200 million that it made from China, even then, that film actually likely made some profit. Now, did it make the $100 plus million in net gain, net profit? Probably not, because you got to take into account what you uh, have to take out, rather, of, the, of that China number, because that's going to definitely have it be down. But it has gotten to the point where it's made enough, Fast 9 has, where I think even I can at this point look to it and say, it it's made some money. Not as much as the current number says, just because of, again, that, that huge China amount. But it's, again, one of the only films that's a big budget film that can really say that at this point. The other film that has not reached that point yet, but could very well reach that point in the next couple weeks and this is something that I've been saying for a while, is whether you like the film or not, the fact that Shang-Chi is doing incredibly well in the domestic marketplace, doing so well enough in the domestic marketplace that it is likely to make money, to make its money back and to make a little bit of profit. I know I had someone in the chat a couple of streams ago who was, you know, um, you know, fighting me on this point, and hopefully... After the weekend numbers came in, they've they've changed their tune. I have not seen that person in the chat yet, but if they do pop into the chat, hopefully, hopefully they've woken up to it. Anyway, Andrew Hayes says apparently Daniel Craig shocked Hollywood by saying that Bond should not be a woman. Shocking. I know. Seriously, he points out a fact. He he points out a fact that a man named James Bond should simply be and always be a man named James Bond. You can make your female spy film. No one's, and, here, and this is the biggest thing about all of it, right? I think Young Rippa talks about this a lot, about, about uh, tokenization. There's nothing stopping any of these Hollywood types or any of these people whining on social media from making their own content. If they want to have their own equivalent of a female James Bond, there's nothing stopping them from doing it. However, if the project f fails and ultimately fails, and likely would fail if they tried to push for the various political elements that they would likely would try to push for, they cannot then come back and try and say, oh, it's all because of misogyny. And that's really what it comes down to. They don't want to make their own properties. They don't want to make their own own ideas because they know that the vast majority of audiences are going to reject them. Whereas if they are able to infiltrate and take over established properties like that of James Bond and so many others, they know that there is a built-in fan base. So even if the film is not well-received, even if it alienates a lot of people, they don't care because in the end, it's going to get them enough to make it seem like people want it. It's the dangerous game they're trying to play, and it seems to be failing in many accounts, at least based on numbers. 
Project Storyline, what's going on? Joey Horn is a member, says, How long has this Bond film been in the can? It feels like they've been talking about it for years. Yeah, this film was set to come out back in what? As early as 2020, maybe 2019? This film has been pushed back so many times. Probably one of the most pushed back films. In fact, it, it got a lot of attention because it was really the first major film to actually move, to actually blink. And it led to a lot of other uh, movies and a lot of other studios to move their films pretty much uh, because of it, which I find interesting. Sizer says, fun fact, Shrimp Alfredo is the official dinner of the Ghostbusters. I ain't Alfredo no ghost. (laughs) (laughs) Brian Barth, what's going on? The Physics Channel with Kenny Lee. I have not watched a single Daniel Craig Bond movie. I would absolutely recommend Casino Royale. I think that film is fantastic. Obviously, do whichever you want to do, but I would recommend it. Bruce says, it's the first time ever, not only I'm not looking forward to a Bond film, but I do not care one bit. Yeah, my dad has been a longtime Bond fan, and I've talked to him a couple of times about this, and he also is kind of just like, yeah, I don't really know what's going on with it, and I'm not really all that, you know, interested and I'm, I'm not that surprised. I really am not. Mark Lizeth, what's going on? One Man Show, welcome. Uh, Lunatic A, welcome to the channel as well. Thank you for being here. CW Trixie, what's going on? Uh, Forever Sci-Fi has said, I'd rather watch GoldenEye. GoldenEye's fantastic, dude. GoldenEye's my jam. That was the bond that came out when I was growing up. I, I grew up during the Pierce Brosnan years, which are not <laughs> some of the best. But GoldenEye is classic, man. Goldeneye's great. Rosie says, I can't even recall the last movie I was excited about except for the new Ghostbusters. Hey, I'm hoping it's good. The the trailers so far are doing exactly what they need to. I think they're going to be able to build up enough hype among Ghostbusters fans and and be able to excite enough new fans as well. So we'll see. We'll see if it's able to make any money. But of course, just like any big budget film, that still remains to be seen. Mark says, I watched the new Dune. I preferred the Lynch version more. Dude, um, I have i haven't heard really that perspective from a lot of people. I've just heard a lot of people say they really like this one. But I don't think anyone, for me, it doesn't make any sense for anyone to say that they prefer the Lynch one. And it's not because I'm, I'm not saying that, in you know, for you, you enjoy the Lynch one more. I'm saying more so the Lynch one, for me, is just so bad I, I can't see how even I can't see how any movie <laughs> could be compared in that way. Crisco says, "Do you think people are losing interest in Top Gun Maverick due to all of the delays?" My friend really wants to see Bond, so I will probably end up seeing it. No, I definitely do. This is something where we're going to see this impact happen across all studios, all films from all different times, right? Whether they were a 2019 or 2020 release or. Um, actually more so 2020 release, whether it were a 2020 release, 2021 release, I think you're going to see any film that gets delayed is going to have this type of an impact because you're correct. When you start to, again, get excited for a movie and then all of a sudden it, you're told you got to wait six months and then you get close to the return of the film and then all of a sudden you get told it's another three months. People only will put up with that for so long before internally or even externally they say, okay, I'm, I'm done. I'm tired. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of getting pumped just to be let down because it is indeed something that people don't want to experience. No one likes being disappointed. And when you're disappointed countless times because of one specific thing, it easily leads to, and it makes sense as to why it would lead to, the ability of people just to kind of just shut themselves off from it. Griffin Turbo, what's going on? Welcome back. Welcome to Jurassic Park. James Dashie, thoughts on the new on the two Kill Bill movies? Haven't really watched them all the way through. I, I've watched them like kind of like half watching, doing other things. So I haven't actually like sat down and been like, okay, I want to see this film. I want to see all of the references in it. I think if I watched it now, I probably would would maybe like it a little bit more. But I uh, my my memory of it was nothing special though. I was kind of like, okay, there was some cool stuff in there, but. Eh. But I'm absolutely willing to, of course, um, see see it again and watch it again and actually like take the time to to study it, as it were. Rowdy says, if No Time to Die was coming from a much smaller studio, I would think with how much money it needs to make, it would bankrupt the studio. Yeah, for most studios, this would be a complete, 
game ending for it because that's just an insane amount of money to make and that it needs to make. So we're, we're talking about a film that could theoretically lose over $200 million when everything is said and done. Uh, PNR, Cop Guy, what's going on? Welcome back to the chat. Uh, Rob D. Tag to say, so they hired J.K. Rowling to write Matrix 4. <laughs> that's the thing, though, is that she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, that would make people mad if they hired her. Because they view her as, as as being an enemy. Laura says, So, Grace Randolph just did a review of the Star Wars Visions series, and she really didn't like it. She said she didn't feel like she said it didn't feel like Star Wars and were too short. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even know that is that a series that just came out? Or I, I haven't really I haven't really heard much about it. I'm not surprised. Cause current you know, current Disney Star Wars just there isn't a lot of stuff to to really get excited about when it comes to it. When everything is said and done, Snorri Poopa says, "Oh no, all father, you are concise and to the point." I was referring to the master of the streams that never end. Ah, gotcha. Let's see. Rosie says, "Is it just me or does nine hundred million on an entertainment seem rather obscure or rather obscene? Not to be too preachy, but aren't there hungry people in the world too?" Oh, absolutely. Now, again, I think that it needs to be clarified that when we say it needs to make nine hundred million dollars, the film itself only cost around—I say only cost around four hundred and fifty million dollars or so. So it, it did. It's not that the nine hundred million is what it cost to make, and that's why it needs to make it back. It's the cost of the film is around $450 million when you have marketing attached to it. You then have to take into account the fact that the studio only gets around 60% of the total box office number back, which means only once the worldwide box office reaches 900, you know, actually more accurately, $750 million or so is when it would actually have made its money back. I still agree, though, as a general precept that the fact that a movie is getting as much as it is or is needing to get as much as it does is, yeah, it, it kind of raises some questions, right? You're like, all of this money being put forth and, and, and put towards films, which in many ways are not really original, in many ways are incredibly artificial, and yet think about where that money could go. Think about a film, I would even say, think about like a film like Endgame, which almost made like $3 billion and made hundreds of millions of dollars in net gain profits. And think about how many people, as you just said correctly, I think, that that could have helped. Let's see, Awesome One says, are you real? Are you a bot? No, I'm not a bot. I'm not a bot. I just, you know, spit out, spit out that hot fire. I just spit out that hot fire from time to time. And I'm not a math expert either. I know it might seem like it. Math has always been my, my least favorite subject. But it just so happens that these equations, once once you learn them, it's like, okay, this is fun. This is fun. I agree, Hologram Nunchuck. It is crazy. right? Even if it's not $900 million like MovieWeb claims, 750 is still incredibly high. For any film. Awesome one says, I care, not for the movie, but I care. I understand. Andrew Hayes, more like no time to care. Interesting. <laughs> Souls Ad, what's going on? Super Anime Gamer says, Hey, what is up, my dude? What is going on? Welcome back to the chat. Appreciate you being here. Let's see. Peeves says, do you think major movie budgets are going to drop in the post-COVID world? Uh, yes and no. I would not be surprised if you see a lot of projects get delayed. So the bigger budget uh, projects getting delayed, taking more time, waiting for, and really just trying to wait out the storm of the, 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 the lack of box office. So that way they can try and time the films to get released, hopefully in a, in a market that's better for the bigger budget film. But I think that in that vacuum of films that you're going to maybe see some studios. And this is at least my hope. Maybe you'll start to see some studios throw a little bit of cash. You don't really need much these days to make a really good film. But imagine if they gave, you know, a really talented director $30 million and said, go ahead, do whatever you want to do. I'm sure that you could find a lot of really good films that could come from it. 
because it's normally those other films, those smaller films that these giant studio heads don't really give a lot of attention to. And it gives these filmmakers kind of free reign to be able to use their creative powers, to use their own creative freedom. And I, I think that it would be a very good thing for them to do. Do I think they're going to do it? I honestly don't. As far as um, you know, letting these people do the things that they do as they wait for their giant big budget films to finally be <laughs> in a position to be profitable again. But we'll just have to wait and see. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, what's going on over on Odyssey? The R over there says, Hail and hail to the Valkyries. Tomorrow never dies is better than Golden Eye. I will fight you on that, good sir. Please explain the logic of saying tomorrow never dies. That's the second one, correct? That uh, that he did. But no, no, no. D- Golden Eyes just got way too many great things. And and let's just be honest for a second. The reason why, the reason why Golden Eye is and always will be better than any other Pierce Brosnan Bond is because the Golden Eye game on N sixty four is one of the best games ever made let alone the best James Bond game ever made. And I think when you add that just to all of the really awesome, hilarious moments, entertaining moments that exist within GoldenEye, I think you soon start to realize just how wrong you you really are. Just how wrong you really are. Anyway, uh, Forever Sci-Fi says, Anyone remember the James Bond Jr. cartoon? He was James Bond's nephew. No, I had no idea that was a thing. Uh, This is a joke from another stream. Awesome one says, Jessica would be great at Jessica Movie Blog. Yeah, could be. But I I was, you know, not born as a a Jessica. (laughs) Thank the Lord. Joey Horn says, Casino Royale is good. Chase scene that opens the movie is one of the best that I have seen. Absolutely, dude. At an objective level, that that opening sequence, that opening chase is phenomenal. The the visuals, the shots, the, the cinematography, the stunt work done is phenomenal. I will say there is one major flaw with that opening uh, chase sequence in Casino Royale, and the biggest flaw is you can so clearly see when it's Daniel Craig's stunt double because his hair is a different color. That's the one thing that's always driven me crazy about it. And if you ever rewatch it again, look at the hair color of Daniel Craig's James Bond. And every time you see the back of his head, you'll know exactly when it's him and when it is a stunt double. And it's bothered me not just because I've been able to very clearly tell that a stunt double is being used, but also when he's doing things like running, it makes me start to ask questions of, really, you you couldn't do even that stunt? Come on, man. Kara Tharp says, I don't really get why Hollywood hates gingers. Gingers are awesome. My one uh, one, my one of the cousins is a ginger. <laughs> I don't know what the issue with gingers is or, or with recasting gingers to be even different races of people. It's like, for some reason, the gingers just can't get their day for some reason. Yeah, I don't get it either. I'm like part ginger myself. I get a little bit of red in the beard. You know, a little bit of red beard action going on, but... I don't get it either. I don't understand it. I guess there is, you know, there's obviously the the elephant in the room as far as the soul of the individual, right? Do they have a soul or not? Obviously they do. I just always love to just bring bring that up because I would always be able to say the joke of, you know, yeah, you know, I I have a part of a soul. Um <laughs> I have most of my soul because I'm only part ginger. So, you know, the the ginger part of me, you know, no soul attached to that. Anyway, we like to have fun here. That was as, almost as bad as a Dan Vass joke. However, what I will say, if you watch Friday Night Tights, I love the Dan Vass jokes. I find them hilarious. They are fantastic. And I will keep I will keep on defending him until I'm blue in the face because he's awesome. Daniel Thorne over on DLive. What's going on, good sir? Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Cap Strong, what's going on? Um, I would say that plot is a pretty important thing in any movie. If you don't have a good plot it's very hard to enjoy a film. Even if it's a film that's a turn-off-your-brain type experience, you still got to have a a sensible plot. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have a you know groundbreaking plot for every single film, but I would absolutely disagree to, to a very extreme extent that plot is somehow not important. 
you can't have a good movie without a good story. Even if it's got some of the best action sequences, some of the best cinematography in it, if the story sucks, it's, it can't be a good movie. You can still enjoy the film. You can still enjoy the movie. But that that's that's what it is. You can say which things are the most important to you or the most or the most important perceived part of the film, but they don't make the film good. Let us see. And again, thank you all again for being here on YouTube, on DLive, and on Odyssey. Uh, again, you guys are awesome. The R over on Odyssey says, Why Lynn Michelle Yeoh is why I love that movie and she would destroy Boris. No, she wouldn't. And it's it's for one reason. I'm invincible. I mean, come on. How can you how can you not think the character of Boris and the amazing lines he gives? And there's that one scene, he's flipping the pen, and it's full of so much tension. I love it. Nah, 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 man. Goldeneye, so much better. As McCarthy says, this, is, this will be the first Bond since Goldeneye that I will not be seeing opening day. Or at all, unless it's free. I, I hear you, man. I hear you. I, I think that that's what a lot of people are feeling right now. It's amazing how many people that I have seen talk about this. Diehard, longtime fans of the franchise who are like, I'm done. I'm over it. I, I don't need this. It's sad. Rob D, when Top Gun Maverick comes out, Tom Cruise jumping on couch, go see my new movie. It's finally out, and I'm still in love with Katie Holmes. Oh, yeah, that old chestnut. <laughs> that would be hilarious if it happened, though. I will say that much. Eric Zod, off topic, I know you don't care for horror movies, but what is your favorite one of those that you have seen? Yeah, I'm not a fan of horror, but I do like films that are thrillers. So I think thrillers are great. Films like Misery. Oh, man. Oh, Misery. Easily one of my top favorite thrillers of all time. I would put more recent horror films. I thought The Babadook was a really good psychological thriller. I thought also It Follows was a very interesting concept. There's some things I don't like about it morally, but I, I think that the general concept's pretty good. It's very, very creepy, very, very terrifying. There's one scene where it's a shot of the hallway, and then all of a sudden this giant guy just like comes and walks through her friend, and oh my goodness, I remember seeing that the first time, and I got scared to, like, oh, it was, it was terrifying, but... Those would be the films that I could think of off the top of my head. But yeah, all time, I would say favorite thriller probably would be Misery. Obviously, Psycho, I got to put up there as well. Got to go with my classic thrillers. Psycho, I think, has just so much going for it for so many different reasons. But those would be some of the ones that I would think of. I, again, I don't typically like the more traditional horror films. Um, I, I do like, I guess you could say, or I could bring up, I, I do like and I'm a fan of things like Friday the 13th but I would not call myself like a diehard fan of those franchises. Friday the 13th, um, you know, anything with Michael Myers, anything with Jason, I, I love those. Never got into the Nightmare on Elm Streets. Those were a little too creepy for me, um, but yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, Punk Waddle says, Hail to the pepperoni, all father, and all of the pizza people. Thank you, Punk Waddle. I actually had some, uh, some Domino's earlier because we were out of food. So uh, Frey is actually at the store right now getting us some food because I normally get it over the weekend, but she was out of town over the weekend. And by the time she got back, cause it was late, didn't have time to, to go to the grocery. So, uh, we've been without food for a couple of days and we're okay with it, but obviously baby Thor, we, we just, uh, as of today ran out of stuff for him. So he'll, you know, we, we weren't gonna have anything for him tomorrow, uh, to send him uh, to school with. So, <laughs> We had to make sure to take care of that. Daniel Thorne over on DLAV says, Why make a female Bond movie when you can make a Mata Hari movie? She is the archetype for the female spy. Well, that's just the thing is that you don't even need to make a female James Bond. What, what my point was there is that why don't you just make your own property? And again, when I say female James Bond, I mean make a character that is similar in certain aspects to a, I guess you could say to, a, to like a stereotype or to a certain archetype that is like a James Bond, if that's really what you want to do. But make it your own. 
right? Make it your own original story. But as I said, and I'll, I'll double down on this, the reason why they don't do it is because they know if they go that route, it's going to be a failure. They know that they have to use established, pre-established properties that have established fan bases to try and infiltrate these groups to get their messages out there. Because people aren't going to go just watch it on their own because people are going to see the trailers for it and say, this looks stupid. Anyway, super. Star Wars Visions is a miniseries. Each of the episode is its own standalone story written and animated by a different Japanese animation studio. I'm hyped, but only because I'm an anime fan. Okay, that series. That was the one thing. Yeah, I agree. Super. That was the one series that was announced that had any that had piqued my interest at all because of the anime because it being written and animated by a Japanese animation studio. That was the only reason I had any interest in it. So my hope is that because again, Grace Randolph, just because she doesn't like it, doesn't really say a whole lot. (laughs) In fact, I would say in, in certain situations that might even be an endorsement, but that is probably the only thing. That's probably the only thing that, in Star Wars coming up has has at all piqued my interest. So let me know, Super, you know, if you watch it before I do, what your thoughts are on it. So let's see. Uh, the Crafty Tyke, what's going on, good sir? Thank you very much for being here. He says, I'm Dumbledore. Oh, I wish my beard was as colorful as yours. It's three times bigger but gray. Dude, you know what, man? I, I, I would trade for that, to be honest. Because as much as I love my, my red beard, it's got some gray in it too. It's got some gray. It's got some uh, gray streaks. You can kind of see those kind of uh, uh, lining up right there. But I want to have a Dumbledore beard. When I'm older in life, for those that don't know, I, I teach uh, theology and I have uh, a master's in in theology and Catholic theology. So I would love to be like when I'm older, like when I'm like not decrepit. <laughs> I don't know why my mind went there immediately. Not when I'm like, no, I'm decrepitly old and I'm almost like Gary is in a certain way. And I don't know why I always sound a little like Master Rushi when I do this voice. Not like that. But when I'm a little bit older and more distinguished and I've been around for a long time, I, I feel like I want to be able to have that long gray beard. Like, again, I want to have a philosopher's beard. I want to have like a philosopher's look. I want people to look at me and be like, that dude. That dude knows what's up. That dude knows Thomas Aquinas. That dude probably knows some Aristotle, some Plato. Like, that's that's the kind of thing. Um, the goals that you have in life. And I have some weird ones. <laughs> Ambitions in life. Get to a point where I'm old, but not necessarily decrepit. And have a uh, philosopher's beard. Uh, Punk Waddle says, I'm not great at math either, but the cost of the movie to make, plus paying the actors, staff, paying for advertisement, does eat into the overall earnings the box office gain, hence profit margin. Yeah, absolutely, man. And and that's why, you know, production budget, uh, typically you will have some instances of that, including the different, uh, you know, amounts of money that you would pay to your staff. And that's why, for me, it's never been about, here is factually how much money this film made. It's been more so a, here is how much money box office this movie made that that's why i only deal in box office numbers because i could go into and have separate charting which follows blu-ray and 4k sales but after the first few weeks those sales really aren't tracked anymore so it's it's really hard to say after a certain time period how much money has actually been made by a film down down the road so I've always focused more so on, okay, here's the movie, here's how much it costs, here's what we know as far as marketing typically is concerned, here's what we know about their general take at the box office, let's now make some considerations and make some predictions. By the way, after the uh, that article from MovieWeb came out, using their number, so again, the number that's not been verified except by them at this point, based on everything that I've seen, using even their calculations, having the correct 60% take that studios get, the number is actually closer to 785. I forgot that I had written the number down. So $785 million using the number that MovieWeb came up with, which again, I, I think is a little dubious there. For them, if you're using the actual number that most studios will get, it's going to be $785 million the film needs to make in order to break even. As I said, I don't really buy into the number that they gave, which means it's probably closer to $725, $750 million 
to break even. Still not good in either case. In either case, not good. James Pond, your thoughts on Emmy viewers calling out celebrities for not wearing masks? Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I- I'm just amazed. My I- Here's my criticism. Here's what I'm going to call out. Why in the hell are these people watching the Emmys? That That's the bigger problem. That is the bigger problem. Why in the world are they watching Emmys in the first place? When... Anyone who knows anything about what's going on right now in the world, especially in the world of Hollywood, is going to know that these Hollywood elitists have always been above and beyond the rules. Always. There's always exceptions for them. There's always things written into the rules and into the laws that allow them to be able to get away with whatever they want, whether they're in Hollywood, whether they're in government. It doesn't matter. The elitists always will get their own way. George Carlin said it best, and it's been said a lot of times on this channel. They are all in a club, and we ain't in it. And it's true. We're not in it. And this is the reason why that they can do all the things that they do, and they don't have to worry about it. So no, I would say the real criticism should be, why in the world is anyone watching the Emmys? Why in the world is anyone watching it at this point? See, Joey Horn says, I'm going to watch for Craig's double in that chase now. <laughs> As I said, just look at the hair and you'll be able to tell. Be like, oh, look at that. Oh, they're not really hiding it all that well. <laughs> Orange Hour Reviews, better late than never, says, how could I forget it was Tuesday? But anyways, hello, Odin, and I have something to say. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Now ask if anyone knows that quote. I feel like it's from a song. I don't know why my mind went to it being a song lyric, but I, I don't I don't recognize it off the top of my head. I don't understand. Punk Waddle, back to the uh, being a part ginger myself. So you're saying you could be three-fourths soul. Yes, I'm saying that I could have three-fourths of a soul. Though, to be fair, when you look at the red in my beard, it's probably a much higher... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? a much uh, higher uh, fraction because again, it's a very, very small amount. So probably a, maybe like 11 twelfths, perhaps maybe 11 twelfths. Um, so I guess one twelfth, I could say maybe one fifteenth. I will say I am more ginger by a thousand degrees than Elizabeth Warren is native American. That I can say at the very least. I don't know how that math works out, but I'm sticking to it. Rob D, I think there was one movie I was watching, one where the main actor sees, oh, sorry, was a man, but the stunt double was a woman, and they did not do a good job hiding it. Oh, I I, I don't know about that one, but I can say they've done the opposite of that more recently in films like Black Widow. Remember in Black Widow when Taskmaster somehow turned out to be a, a woman? And then they had a clearly a, a man stunt double. <laughs> and then they try to put the face. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Uh, Forever Sci-Fi, who's a member, says, Was it just some guy who joked that they replaced gingers because of what you can rearrange the letters to? <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember uh, uh, who would have said anything like that. By the way, 74 people watching. Please make sure that you smash that like button also i see eric whitaker i see the name eric whitaker in the chat eric are you the eric whitaker that i know by the way if you are eric whitaker he says it's me bro guys okay just so you all know eric whitaker if you want to know where the name odin comes from If you want to know where the name Odin comes from, this dude right here, high school, that's where it came from. Look at that. I've told the story several times over, but now that you're actually here, boom, there it is. Welcome, man. I just saw you in the live chat. I have the chat up here on the other side where I'm like 20 minutes behind, but I saw the name pop up and I'm like, wait a minute. I know this. I know this name. I recognize this person. Let's see. <laughs> Dude, welcome, man. Thanks for being here. 
All right, let me get back to the chat so that I can catch up a little bit with everybody. Oh, man. <laughs> Shout out to Eric, the originator of the name itself. Derek McManus, what's going on, man? Welcome to the chat. By the way, it's 740 in the chat. It's 754 in real life, so I'm about 14 minutes behind. Miss you too, man. Miss you too. I think I think you still I think you still have my number, man. If you if you want to message me, catch up. <laughs> All right, let's see. Daniel Thorne. He says T Mobile Tuesdays is doing no time to die tickets for four dollars. That's close to free. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal. I will say. I used to have T-Mobile. Uh, they offer some pretty good stuff. The, the best thing they offered, though, was you would get the MLB TV for free. And uh, in the end, I just stopped watching MLB and no longer was a big... It was no longer that good of a deal. So I had switched since moved over to Verizon because it just has better coverage, better service in general. I've been happy at the very least. Sci-fi action movie reviews. Welcome, good sir. Uh, the It Follows creature is one scary STD to catch. If you've never seen It Follows, it basically deals with a, I guess you could say, a possession, a demon, a creature, whatever it is you want to call it. Um, and, and you literally catch it through through sex. So it literally is a demonic STD. <laughs> uh, how about that? Imagine being the person trying to pitch that movie. To somebody, I don't know if there's ever been. I don't know if if uh, the guy over at was it Screen Rant. I don't know if he's ever done a a pitch meeting for that movie. But if he hasn't, oh man, there's some gold to be had there if he has not. By the way, Johnny GTO, thank you for the five dollars sasa super chat. He says, "Oh, and I still want more AEW reviews. Love your stuff, brother. Well, thank you, man. Hey, I'm all for doing more stuff on uh, Sports Wars. Next time they do one, I assume the next time there's an AEW pay per view, we'll probably do another live stream watch party because that was a lot of fun. Um, it'd be really cool for us to try and do some AEW uh, weekly coverage over there. So uh, we'll see what happens, though. We'll see what happens." All righty then. Let's see where we are in the chat. By the way, if you are just joining, please make sure that you smash that like button. Andrew Hayes tagged to say, they partly won't make their own Will character properties because it will take too much time and work out, and it will ultimately fail. Well, I think, again, there is definitely some truth to that, but the way in which they try and always curtail that is, once again, by taking on other established properties because it's easier. As you said, it's easier. And I think that's the second one that's actually more more accurate and more to the point. Because I think that they would put the effort in if they thought the films would actually make money. But even they, even the people that try and push these ideologies, even they know that their projects are going to fail. Even though... Uh... <laughs> Eric, I got, I got your message, man. <laughs> Shout out to Eric, man. Oh, I love him. Thank you, man. <laughs> But uh, anyway, as I was saying, um, I think it really is ultimately that second point. And the reason why is is because the fact that if they honestly thought people would pay to go see those movies, I think that what they would end up doing is is they would they would be able to put forth characters. Because when you think about it, a lot of the times with these characters, and a lot of times with the directions they're trying to push for these these more politically motivated characters, it doesn't really take a lot of effort. It really doesn't take a lot of effort. The issue, of course, is that people don't want to buy it. So that is the ultimate issue, I think, is that they know that what they're pushing forward is only going to appeal to a very small demographic, a very small portion of the population. And it's not going to be enough for them to be able to do anything with it. It's not going to be enough for them to be able to make any profits. It's not going to be enough for them to be able to grow because it is very closed off, right? It's it's in an interesting way, a lot of the times you'll hear people like this try and talk about open-mindedness, is a very closed-minded position that only certain people are going to be able to actually hold on to. So yeah, I would say it's probably more that second one than anything else. Crisco says, I think the rhythm section was supposed to be an attempt at a female Bond-style film from Eon Productions, the same company behind the Bond films, but it flopped. Yeah, and I think that they try to go a little bit too artistic with that film, which probably is one of the many reasons why 
that film had flopped. There have been other femme fatale movies and series that have been around for a while, and some of them have been good. Some of them have, have been successful. Anyway, uh, Peep says, After Dune, do you know of any other potentially good movies coming to HBO Max this year or next year? I know that Dune is the, the next one set to come out. Um, I don't know the exact HBO Max release schedule. Um, let me try and see and pull that up if there's any other um, HBO Max movies set to come out. Because there's the September release schedule. But I am not really interested in that. And now I'm clicking the back button and it's just like, nope, we're not letting you go back. Which is just silly. So same day premieres. So let's see what we got. Um, so you have, is this a movie or a series? It's Who Made Tony Soprano Many Saints of Newark? So I know that some people are excited for that. So The Many Saints of Newark um, is set. Let's see. It's a movie. Okay, yeah. In theaters and streaming, exclusively on HBO Max on October 1st. So I know some people, I, I never got into The Sopranos, so I'm not really excited for it. But I, I think that that is something that some might be. So there you have The Many Saints of Newark coming out October 1st. October 22nd is then... Uh, the film Dune. So that is going to be the next film there. Uh, let's see. A film called King Richard, which is a legendary tennis. Eh. Uh, and then there's Matrix Resurrections. So, hey, at least it's going to be on HBO Max. At least I'm not going to have to pay extra money to go see that in theaters. Thank the Lord. <laughs> I don't want to watch it, but I kind of feel like I need to to, to cover it. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say for some people, The Many Saints of Newark might be uh, one of the only films left to come out on HBO Max. That's that's left. Uh, at the very least, that, that I can see at this point. So, anyway, I know that there are a lot of people, though, that are excited who are fans of The Sopranos because... Uh, it's um uh, I mean I'm blanking out, but it's his it's his kid, uh, uh, Gandolfini. It's Gandolfini's kid who is playing that part, and I think that's incredible that that was able to work out the way that it did. Daniel Thorne says Odin wants a Merlin length beard. No 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 no. I, I want a Gandalf length beard. That's what I really want. <laughs> it's a simple request from from a simple man. Snorpoopus Cuber says, I don't watch their shows. Why would I watch their award shows? Yeah, that's a great point, too. Why would you watch the award show to reward shows that you're not watching and know nothing about? Ah, that's some logic right there. <laughs> yeah, Rosie, I thought it was a quote. One man show. Okay, apparently, okay, sorry, sorry. It was from Bloody Highlander. Yeah, like I am an expert in Highlander. Come on, people. <laughs> Force of Light Entertainment. What's going on, Force of Light Entertainment? How y'all doing? The lovely ladies of Force of Light Entertainment. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Thanatos says it was also in the soundtrack. Maybe that's where I had heard it then. Maybe. Forever Sci-Fi, who's a member, says, Now I want to see a Bond villain say, You idiots! You captured his stunt double! Find them! I'm glad that I got that reference right away. If you throw me a, a Spaceballs reference, I'll pick that one up right away. It's these more obscure ones of, oh, it's a lyric from a song in a movie that I've seen once? And I wasn't even a fan of it? <laughs> Come on, people. I appreciate that forever sci-fi. Super says, I haven't seen Visions yet, but I'm looking forward to it, especially Studio Trigger's episode. I do suspect Grace is right, though, just knowing how different Eastern storytelling is. Yeah, and I think that it might also... What if that was actually the way that like Star Wars started to see some type of resurrection? When, if, if and when, obviously, again, it's a big if here. Let's say this series is really successful, like with... Um, anime fans uh you know obviously star wars fans too and what if like star wars all of a sudden starts to get a new life like imagine if disney decided instead of doing this this china specific identity politics specific agenda 
What if they decided, hey, we're just going to cater to the Japanese market? To be honest, I think a lot of people in this chat would probably actually be, not that they would be open to, like, welcoming Disney Star Wars by any means, but I think they would be a little bit more open. I think that there would be, like, a little crack opening if the announcement was made, oh, we're going to focus on the Japanese marketplace bringing in Japanese creators and artists in. I don't know. Just the thought of that kind of gets me like, oh, that could actually be a really cool direction. I actually might be interested in that. That's just me, though. Orange Hat. Odin is also a quote from the first Highlander movie, Clancy Brown, Kurgan said. Yeah, that's what everyone's been uh, saying. So, <laughs> uh, Rosie12 says, Odin, it's a Neil Young song. Hey, hey, my, my, into the black. Okay, okay. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that's what it was. Uh, IRA Darth Aggie. <laughs> Maybe I will. Go as uh, quarter ginger. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Quarter black might get offended by it. He might think I'm trying to trying to make fun of him, which is obviously not the case. Andrew Hayes says, I think Paramount Universal have moved all of their upcoming movies to somewhere in 2022. I know that there were some recent uh, rumblings of films getting moved. So yeah, I definitely think that that is, that is something that is true. A lot of films have indeed been moved. Uh, a big movement happened, especially with films like Top Gun. Uh, a lot of films did get pushed to 2022. There is uh, a lot of truth to that. Super says, the funniest thing about the Emmys was Hamilton being nominated and actually winning. Ha That's just crazy to me. Wait, Hamilton? Like, like the, the musical, like the one that was on I'm trying to see how that, like the one that was on Disney, it's a musical. It's not a TV show. That's insane. That is so stupid. God, that's so stupid. It's literally a Broadway musical that they filmed. That's not a TV show. If anything, that's a movie. God, that's just. In the history of all of the musicals and plays that have been filmed, is this the first time that one actually got nominated for an Emmy of all things? That's so silly. Uh, there is Eric Whitaker, as I said. I'm 20 minutes behind. So, again, thank you for popping in, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Snorta Poopa says, Custer was more Native American than Elizabeth Warren. I think most of us <laughs> are in a, in a certain way. Thanatos uh, Felicitas. Uh, I like the use of stunt doubles in Spaceballs. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's the best way to use a stunt double. Uh, Sammy G, no, I don't. Uh, for a while, at least. I don't think we're going to have any major big-budget Star Wars films. Or, sorry, big-budget films um, as far as making profits go for, for a while. I know that many experts, so-called experts, said 2023 is when we'll get back to 2019 levels. We'll have to wait and see. Because I think by the time 2023 comes around, I think the market is going to have changed so much because look at where the studios are putting all of their money. All of the studios are putting so much money, so much um, you know, R&D into streaming services. That is their focus because they know that is the future. And they know that bottom line, if they can build their own infrastructure, which is exactly what they've been doing with the pandemic. Again, these major studios, these major companies... They, they got massive profits from bailouts, from, from a wide variety of things, right? Lockdowns, forcing people to do certain things would give them a lot of money. So they, have, they had a lot of cash to burn. And so what they're doing is they're building these infrastructures. They're building up their programs so that what they can do then is eventually when they move away from the traditional theatrical release model, they'll have the infrastructure to be able to support getting literally net gain profits. So, yeah, I, I think that you're still going to have movies in theaters for a while, but you're not going to have it in the same way. I think gone are the days of the massive $2 billion film making massive profits. I do think that's done, at least in the way that we are typically used to seeing it. Hannibal Grimm says, get that damn pinky down. No, pinky up. It's fancy. And I'm a fancy guy. I am a fancy guy. Forever Sci-Fi says, I think that was E.T. where they had a woman play Elliot's stunt double. You really notice on the bike chase scene with the size difference. Oh, okay, that's funny. 
so yeah, I guess it was, it would have been what an adult woman, <laughs> an adult woman stunt doubling for a young boy. I, again, that's really the only way uh, that that really can work. I guess that's interesting though. Uh, Johnny GTO again. Thank you for that super chat. I, I very much appreciate it, man. Hail to the origin story. says punk waddle. Absolutely. And again, miss you too, bro. Daniel Thorne over on DLive says, so you want to be more like Master Roshi. Does that include chasing after and oogling? No, no. It's the good qualities of Master Roshi, not the creepy ones. Andrew Hayes, if anyone cares, Black Widow will be free on Disney Plus on October 6th. So for anyone that decided to wait to see the film, hey, there you go. Keely Chow, what's going on? What's going on? Appreciate it. You guys are awesome. And again, if you are here in the chat, make sure you smash that like button. Lost 20 viewers. Not sure where everyone went. I guess, is the is the real BBC still somehow running? Anyway, the R over on Odyssey. Alone over on Odyssey says, The first movie that is a cultural phenomenon like Lord of the Rings is when people will get used to going to theaters again. Yeah, and I don't know if that's ever going to happen. Think about how much fear-mongering has been done. Think about how much our minds have been literally transformed by the fear. Obviously, there's a lot more people waking up to some of the nonsense. But at the end of the day, people have been trained. And I'm just saying, wait for... There's going to be another... uh, There's going to be another shoe-dropping. And it's not going to be COVID-related. It's going to be, now that we know this can work, now that we know we can use fear and trust the science to push forth these agendas and to scare people into submission, just wait. Just wait for the conversations getting shifted over to things like, oh, climate change. The only way to to fix this is by locking down the economy to help heal the planet. Or something similar to that effect. If you don't think it's going to happen, you have not been paying attention. Because there's a lot of things we said were never going to happen. Remember, oh, there's never going to be a vaccine passport. That's crazy conspiracy nonsense. Here we are. Here we are. Anyway, Alex McCarthy says, Speaking of AEW, I'm watching AEW Dark on my TV. Boom, Alex. By the way, there was a video. I have not watched all of it, so I don't know how true it is. But... It, one, talked about Bray Wyatt coming to AEW, so apparently there's, like, contract negotiations going on there. Whenever that comes through, and if it does, whoo-wee, AEW is in a good position because that dude is a creative genius. And two, I didn't even know this was a thing, apparently Kevin Owens is even in talks with AEW. I mean, at this point, I don't know who's going to be left. I don't know who is going to be left in the WWE. When everything is said and done, when all the dust has settled, I really don't. It, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. It's kind of crazy. Let's see. Uh, Gardo Martinez. What's going on, good sir? I'm always late for live streams. Bro, there's no reason to. There's no reason to be late. I, I come on the same time. Almost every time. There's... There's uh, very few exceptions to that. Last week, I had a a later start, and that was the first time I'd had a later start in a very long time, for the better part of a year. There's been a few that I've had to cancel along the way. That is, again, that's more likely to happen when there's people in town. But a delayed start, very rare. Very, very rare. So it's always good. Follow me. Again, I have social media. I'm on Minds. I'm on Gab. I'm on Twitter. I have a Discord server as well. So I, I cover pretty much all the bases. I'm on Locals too. Um, so I cover all those bases. Try try to give as many people as many options as they can. Within reason. <laughs> uh, Andrew Biko, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, the movie... Uh, dude, that movie's just terrible. <laughs> you see, I I could actually probably win that challenge only because I would be laughing. I wouldn't be cringing. I would just be laughing. And here's the thing. Even with that one, like even with that uh, film as bad as it is, I think, <laughs> oddly enough, I think that the visual effects are actually not bad. Like the, uh, the, the elemental effects. Now, I can't remember if this was actually factually like the case 
or if I was just so amazed at how bad the film was that when I was expecting everything to be complete crap, I was like, oh, look at that. That's kind of cool. Oh, that kind of looks a little bit real. Like, I'm wondering if it was like my brain was just trying to make me think it was better than what it actually was. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, Let's see. Bruce says, I would be so open to Star Wars anime. Yeah, again, anime, manga seems to be the future. Look at how successful a lot of those things have been as of late. I wouldn't still trust it even as anime if it's headed by Kathleen Kennedy, but hey. Soul Assassin, always go with the soup instead of the special. <laughs> you see, I like when you give me references that I can pick up, man. What did he order? The special? That's what I ordered. Change mine to the soup. Good call. So many great films. Or rather, so many great moments in that film. The most successful Bond villain, Goon, is Homer Simpson, where he worked for Hank Scorpio. He captured the Bond character and got him killed. I am not a, a Simpsons guy, so I do not... I don't remember that episode or what that reference is. Andrew Hayes, Kingsman seems to have been moved around more than No Time to Die. I think people have lost interest in that movie as well. Yeah, and the difference is that Kingsman doesn't have nearly as long of a pedigree to be able to have already a built-in audience to the same degree, to the same extent. So yeah, I would agree to an extent there because of the amount of delays. Probably, to be honest, I think they've had the same number of delays. But see, uh, 70B says, in free structures oh you and your spelling infrastructures super there was also the snl win at the emmys i forget which category they qualify for but it was up against only one other show i guess uh, variety show but i guess that would be the late night shows because yeah i mean do they put up uh, i thought for some reason i always thought snl was going to be put up against things like colbert and daily show and things like that maybe maybe it's not yeah, the Emmys are very, I mean, when you look at things like the Emmys, the Oscars, obviously now, and then mostly, most of all the Grammys, the Grammys are the worst of all, because literally there are a thousand different categories, and it's like, okay, so basically everyone gets one, everyone gets a, a trophy at this point. Punk Wild's still here, just eating dinner, well, thanks for being here. See, Super says, also, have you heard about the recent Paramount rumors about making content exclusive for Paramount Plus and Paramount potentially going up for sale? Thoughts? Ah, I mean, we have so much streaming content now. I think that in the end, it's just, it's going to create so many, (sighs) we have too many streaming services. We have way too many streaming services. And I really hope that there is some type of, you know, what's it called? collection over time or consolidation is the word I was looking for. I hope there is a consolidation of these happening over time into something that is a little bit more palatable because in the end right now, if things keep going the way they're going with the way the streaming services are set up, we're just going back to cable without cable. We're just going to be going back to, to the cable services where you're, you're spending an insane amount of money to have an insane number of choices and you still feel like you have nothing to watch. <laughs> I just think that that's, I just think that that's when, uh, that's what it's going to lead to. Let's see. Forever sci-fi people in the courts have given the government permission to suspend rights during emergencies. No way to, uh, no way avoid, they avoid abusing. That's why all we can do is hope for, um, obviously courts to speak up to the best of their ability. In many cases they already have, and they've still been, uh, delayed or rather they've still been denied and ignored. And so really, yeah, our only hope left at this point are for states to start rising up to say, no, screw you. Screw you guys. We're going over here. And who knows? I don't think it's going to happen. But obviously, the more the more time goes by, the more things we have, the more likely. Andrew Hayes says, only Brock Lesnar will be left and he has to wrestle Paul Heyman. Yeah, seriously. And, you know, if any wrestler is not going to go to AEW, I think it's going to be Brock Lesnar because Brock Lesnar, I think, asked for way too much money for way too short of a schedule. And if there's anything that AEW is not, 
it's not one of those types of organizations. Harvick says, how was the gummy pizza you ate a couple weeks ago? I didn't actually eat it. I still have it, actually, because I'm actually not a fan of gummy products. But I have it because a subscriber sent it to me, and uh, I think it's awesome. It's a good substitute for uh, pizza when there is no pizza. Kevin Owens' contract is up in January and has been teasing about hopping ship, and I've heard about Wyatt to either AEW or Impact. I think Wyatt would be so much better served on AEW, man. I know that one could argue AEW is just full of so many names and it's so crowded, but because of the deal that AEW has been able to broker between all of these different groups, I mean, he could. St- there's so many titles at play uh, in this essence, you know? See, Hannibal Grimm tagged and said, There's Odin on the walls, Odin in the sink, Odin on the ceiling. There's Odin everywhere. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Agarda Martinez, who is a member, says, It's because of the work I am late. But hey, I recently got a new job. Thank God I'll try and be on time here, though. Hey, dude, no. Work is a good thing. Never, ever apologize for work. It's part of what being human is all about, man. They burn out our village at the start of every Robin Hood movie. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny because, like, as a kid, I never got that reference at the beginning of Men in Tights. And I, I was watching it uh, more recently in the last year. And I was just like, ah, oh, this is such a great, great sequence. Not, of course, not to mention the, you know, yo, 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 check it out. Prince John the Sheriff. So good. And I said, hey, hey. You gotta be a mind to wear tights. Uh, Hardwick, to paraphrase Captain Barbosa, you'd best start believing in conspiracy theories. You're in one. I actually really like the ending of that. I actually really like the ending to Pirates 2. It's definitely not as good as Pirates 1, but the ending, when it happened in theater, I remember being in the theater, I think I saw it opening night, and when Barbosa's coming down the stairs and he starts speaking, I was just like, oh, this is awesome. I don't know, it just got you so hyped. Got you so hyped. Egardo, you were supposed to destroy the cable, not join them. That's why I f- that's how I feel about these services, for sure. Finn Balor is another name that could work for AEW, especially with his connections with Kenny Omega. Oh no, for sure. I-, I don't know if he's on the table or not. I don't know if he signed a new contract or not, but we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Bruce says, since 1977, a lot of Japanese anime have had I've got a bad feeling about this in them, watched many of them myself. Manga anime creators have love for the original Star Wars, so it actually could very well be a uh, a match made in heaven. It actually very well could be a match made in heaven. Let's see, Kiko Rogers says, try gummy strawberries or root beer bottles. Delicious. Hmm. I don't know if I've ever been a fan of those, to be honest. I want to say the root beer bottle. Are those like the bottle caps? They always tasted a little bit more like, um, like chalk. Just Joe forty seven. What's going on, bro? What's going on? Uh, let's see. Hardwick says that line was from the first Pirates of the Caribbean, not the second. No, if you're talking about, you best start believing. Oh, about ghost stories. Okay. No, no, no. So the scene I was thinking of factually comes from the second movie when Barbosa is coming down the stairs. And I want to say, I forgot what the line he said was, but yes, you're talking about the moment in the first film when he's talking to the lady, when he says, you best start believing in ghost stories. There's another line he says at the very end. Is it just that he says like, where's my ship or take me to my ship? Anyway, you know what I meant? You know, know the thing, you know, the thing. We were both right. Hannibal Grimm, tights, tight, tights. It's great that I was able to pick up exactly the tone that you had on the second tights. So hype at the end of the Pirates 2, and then Pirates 3 went all wedding during a side... Oh, man. The wedding during the sword fight at the end of 3 is just so bad. It's so cringe. It's so awful. (sighs) Happy, happy cola, says Kiko Rogers. Haribo Happy Cola? What? Forever Sci-Fi, I do agree with you in principle. There's only one Pirates of the Caribbean film. I would agree with that assessment for sure. Absolutely. Uh, the R says, get on Gab. Uh, I am on Gab. I, I said that I, I have Gab. I have Gab. Yeah, I have Twitter. I have Gab. And I post links to all my videos when, when they go live. 
Uh, rather, I post links to all my videos. Yeah, on, on my YouTube videos when they go live. Um, unfortunately, there is not any integration of videos into Gab itself because there is Gab TV, but you got to pay to be a part of Gab TV. It's just not again. So again, if you want to though have links and reminders of stuff, I, I do post on Gab. I don't post a lot there. Uh, I still do most of my traffic on Twitter because that's just where. You know, most people are at this point, but I do post links to videos. Uh, if I have time before a live stream to promote the live stream, I, I post things on there too. So yeah, if those are the places that you get your information from, hey, I I provide. I provide as many options as I possibly can. Jungle Cruise 2 Anaconda says CWD Trixie. That's that's fantastic. All right, well I have caught up in the chat. And uh, we got about six minutes left or so, so I'll go ahead and just start to wrap things up then. And uh, yeah, Stephanie B says uh, she's hungry, and I think the wife came home from the store. So my hope is, and sometimes she forgets it, but my hope is we were um, out of ice cream. So it'd be really nice if if there was some ice cream upstairs. We'll again cross cross my fingers and really hope that that is indeed the case. Um, but with that being said, I guess one last thing that I will say, since I didn't get to cover it directly, is that Dune is actually not uh, doing uh, all that bad. It was expected to make around $20 million in the 16 or so markets it opened up in, and it ended up making around $40 million in those markets instead. So for the fact that it actually was able to basically double what the expectations were, I don't think is a, a small feat. I think that it is a a very good indication that Dune has a, a pretty good chance of being able to do a lot better than some people may have thought, including myself. I, If you had asked me a month or two ago, and you probably find videos of me saying it, I, I was like, I, again, don't think Dune has much of a chance because of how obscure of a story it is. It really is more of a cult um, classic than anything else at this point, and also because of a high budget, though the budget's definitely not as high as something like No Time to Die. Whereas with No Time to Die, the film needs, needs to make somewhere between $750 and $785 million to break even. A film like Dune only needs to make around $412 million to break even based on the $165 million budget. So, is it doable? It is doable. Is it likely? Still remains to be seen. We do have some early reporting as far as what the early projections are, and I believe that I have covered this in a previous video, but there are some long-range estimates that are available for some of these films that we have coming forward. Maybe there isn't one for Dune uh, quite yet. Let me try and see, because I know for No Time to Die, just in case anyone is wondering, because it's not looking that great domestically at the very least for this film, uh, no Time to Die is expected to make between $56 million and $85 million domestically in its opening weekend, and a total of $140 to $240 million in the domestic market. Again, I am going to be very surprised if that film gets to $200 million domestically, if I'm going to be honest. If the movie performs incredibly well opening weekend, Obviously, then, and has a very small second weekend drop-off, obviously, we might start to have a conversation. But yeah, if you're looking at No Time to Die, and also, let me just put this into perspective for you. And I know that there's a lot of people that are excited for Venom 2. I am not one of them. I'm, I'm open to watching it, but I'm not all that pumped for it. Venom 2 is expected to make 45 to $65 million. So again... Venom 2, 45 to 65 million opening weekend, 105 to 145 million dollars total domestically. No Time to Die, the last of the James Craig James Bond film with a 300 plus billion dollar budget, 56 to 85 million domestically. So not much more. And No Time to Die is coming out in the second weekend of Venom 2. So it's going to be incredibly interesting. It's going to be incredibly interesting to see how well or not well no time die no time to die does we should be getting some dune numbers uh, probably sometime next week um, if the way these films update with the long range tracking uh, remains accurate um, because we'll also have Halloween kills so I know I don't know if Cobra Kyle 79 is around or not but I know he's been a big uh, he's been really looking forward to Halloween kills coming out we'll have some early numbers on that by that time as well. But again, just getting a little bit of an update there when it comes to 
Um, films like Dune doing a lot better than people had expected in the foreign marketplace. We'll see if it's able to play out domestically or not. And of course, we'll have some connections or rather we'll have some indications of how well or not well it's going to do as it continues to be released in more foreign markets and eventually towards the end of October released domestically. And we'll track it. We'll see. Again, $412 million internationally is that sweet spot number for Dune. Is it possible? I would say their prospects are a lot higher than they were before by the fact that it made twice as much than they had originally estimated. Still has a long way to go. Again, $40 million sounds nice, but... $412 $412 million is still a lot of ways to go. So anyway, let's go ahead and shout out my members at the Army of Asgard level and above. Soul Extraction, Malvin, Dolores Ed, Twirly Wolf, Low Pro, Farrah Lovely, Valiant Renegade, Jonathan Marshall, Eric Kay, Cornelius Schultz, Fedigator, Gonzalo Bergali, George Molo, George, Grimm's Math, The Wicked Plumber, Gomer Kyle 79, Kara Tharp, Dad May Walk 55, M Tax Shot, Forever Sci Fi, Rosie G12, Andrew Hoyle, Orange Chat Reviews, J Stowe, and Aiden Vickery. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. And again, thank you to everyone for being here today. I hope that you uh, had a good time talking about some box office, some movie talk discussions. Uh, I had a lot of fun myself. Please make sure that you smash that like button and you light up that fire button on the way out. If you are watching on Odyssey is where that fire button would be lit up there. And again, the R, thank you very much for being over there. And for everyone on YouTube, thank you very much for your love and your support tonight. Uh, What kind of ice cream, Rob D? I don't know. Typically, I like uh, cookies and cream. It's my go-to is cookies and cream. It's just the way it's got to be. Um, but I also like my wife usually gets uh, cookie dough. And normally it's just, mwah, it's nice. It's beautiful. It's delightful. It's fantastic. Um, Kara Tharp is correct. Ice cream is life. It truly is. It just makes me so, so very happy. Um, thank you, Andrew Hayes. This is the line that I was thinking of. Yes. So tell me, what's become of me ship? And then he eats the apple. And then the monkey screams. It's such a great ending. Such a good ending. And then three came out, and all hope was lost. All hope was lost. By the way, I have been listening to the audiobook of Dune, uh, the one that actually has the different actors doing, like, the voices and everything. And I'm about 20, 25 minutes in, and I'm liking it. I didn't listen to it at all today, but I was listening to it the other day. Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to finish it before the movie comes out. But, uh, yeah. We'll see. There's a lot of stuff I need to do. There's books I want to listen to. There's the Rogue Squadron book that just came out, finally unabridged on audiobook that I'm going to listen to. And there's also a lot of reading I want to do as well. There's stuff that I want to learn. Man, so many things going on. And of course, obviously, spending time with uh, with family as Hannibal Hannibal Grimm keeps coming in and I always appreciate it. The fussy, fussy, fussy. Yes. Gotta love that birdcage reference there. Anyway, you guys are all amazing beautiful people. Thank you all very much for being here. He who controls the ice cream controls the universe says Storm of Poop is Cuber, and I would definitely agree with that. Tina says Dune the novel should take precedent. I don't know. There's, again, some things that I want to learn and grow in professionally, so I think those would definitely take precedence, but I totally understand where you're coming from. Chocolate ice cream is good. However, I would say cookies and cream is just fantastic. Always gotta give me Always got to give some birdcage love because it's just funny. Anyway, you guys are all amazing, beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much for your time and attention for being amazing. Have a wonderful night, everybody. And as always, God bless. And now for a huge shout out to all of my September locals, Patreon, and subscribe star members. First with my locals members, Cats app, D Sharp. It's a modern major general story. Laura Bifford to have it, and Robert Barnes. I want to give a shout out to especially to Laura, who is now a double supporter on Locals and on Patreon. So thank you for that. And to all of my Locals members. A shout out also to my Patreon members, Andrew Hoyle, Animation Commentator, Brandon, Brian P., Christopher Bowman, Don Bruno de la Mancha, Father Christopher Miller, Hail to you, Father, Father Damian Cook, Garrett Searles, 
Hannibal Grimm, Harold Francis, Inflamed Wood, Jacob Juice, Jeffrey Toon, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Gomer Kyle 79, Laura the Modern Major General Story once again, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mondo Spieler, Mr. Peabody, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Rosetta Ullen, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, Tina Bojan, and Tina B, the Empress of the Universe, and a shout out also to my subscribe star members, the R, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, John B, Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss, slash the new number two, J. Ra, the Beer Guru, and ZK Man. Thank you all very much for supporting the channel. And I want to give a huge shout out to new members, one time supporters over on Locals, Kara Tharp, K Tharp 56, and Brett D 90. Thank you again for being a one time supporter over on Locals, and also to my newest Patreon member, Stan Gunovic. And hopefully I pronounced that correctly, but thank you for being my newest members. It really does mean a lot. And if you want to have your name shouted out at the end of every single video or live stream on the main channel, please check out the links in the description below, specifically that top link, which will bring you to all of the links to my various social media pages and also places of support as well. And remember that if you join at the Army of Asgard level, you also get access to giveaways of 4K titles. Right now, I have a live giveaway of Snatch on 4K Steelbook. I've also got ones for Dread, uh, Wrath of Man Blu-ray. I've also got A Quiet Place Part 2 on 4K. I've got Top Gun on 4K, Sicario on 4K, tons of films and more to come, especially as more films are getting released for those giveaways. At the uh, Keeper of the Bifrost level, you get all that, plus you get access to an exclusive podcast, podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger. Not only do you get to listen to the podcast, you also get to ask questions that we answer as much as we can and as fully as we can in much more, I guess you could say, uncensored way, but again, a much more free-flowing way for our members over there at the Keeper of the Bifrost level above. And if you join the Chosen of Valhalla level, you get access to all of those things, plus in your first month, you get a free t-shirt, your choice, and I send it to you no matter where you are in the world, and also, you get to once a month be featured on the channel in the Chosen of Valhalla live stream, where we talk about movie, news, and pretty much anything that you want to talk about. So if that all sounds like fun to you, check out those links below. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and as always, God bless.